Hi, everyone. My name is Donato Cabrera, and welcome to this week's Music Wise. Uh, we have such a special guest who I've gotten to know just a little bit over the last few months uh, during this um, time of us being um, in our own little places, uh, taking part on uh, various sessions online. And uh, it was through an incredible uh, uh, online talk series of talk days of talks at Minerva Institute which which Drew and I will talk about I'm sure for a little bit um, but I would like to just start this week's music wise with an introductory uh, video of our guest <laughs> Well, that alone gives us so much to chat and talk about. So please help me welcome Drew Kataoka. Hi, Drew. Hi, how are you? It's great to see you. It's great to see you as well. And, uh, happily, Wisconsin, in this little green room here at Vegas PBS, I'm in the middle of taping um, some youth concert uh, for, that will be dispersed to the uh, Clark County School District here in Las Vegas. And it's, my first time conducting in seven months, which was the strangest sensation I had to say. I saw that picture you posted on social media. That's fantastic. How did it go? So oh, far, so good. well. I, you know, it's the strangest thing waving your arms around and, and you've, given, you've given up to and the, the trust that you must have in order for music to be sounded by the musicians who were really doing all of the work. Um, it, it's such a magical feeling. It sort of took me back that that first upbeat that I gave, and and for that to actually occur, it, it's just so magical. Wow, Drew, where where are you? Where where are you coming from? I always love your background when whenever I see you on various online talks. <laughs> well, thank you for having me today, to talk to you. I'm in uh, I'm in Silicon Valley in the Bay Area. Uh, at my studio, at my headquarters, and I have uh, a, a lot of different art around me and different different works in progress. Uh, so, yeah, I'm I'm here at Drew Kataka Studios. So, Drew, I have so many questions for you with regard to to what you do now, but I I want to sort of go back into time because it's not so often i think most people when they think of uh, someone who is involved in the tech world they may not think of the, that person being uh also in the artistic world you know what i mean it's sort of like it's it's, it's, it's silicon valley uh is is seen as a certain thing and the art and the art world is seen as something else and and what I love about what you do is you bring them together in such a unique and wonderful way. How did this evolve for you personally 
where where was this original inspiration? How did it come to be? Well, when we talk about the the arts and the sciences or technology and the humanities being divided or being perce perceived as divided, uh, at, at times that's a, a real thing that happens in our contemporary world, but it's actually uh, not how it's always been. You know, it, during, during the Renaissance and during other times of great human achievement, uh, we had incredibly integrative, interdisciplinary, interwoven ways of thinking, building, and creating. And so I, I think we've um, more recently over the past uh, centuries become more specialized and siloed, but I also think we're, we're birthing into a, a new renaissance of um, more interconnectedness and it's an opportunity and a time to build a more interstitial tissue between all the different disciplines. So everything comes full circle. Uh, but for me personally, my, my journey starts in Japan. I was born in Tokyo. Uh, I had a, a love of the arts very early on. I, I for my, as long as I can remember, I loved I loved art and uh, the first um, art form that I started in was sumie or Japanese ink painting. Um, I'm biracial, my father is Japanese and my mother is American. And uh, I, uh, this, this particular art form, I uh, studied it for many years and, and mastered it by the time I was in high school and um, then went to Stanford and I actually, financed my education through the sale of my uh, of my artworks and um, was actually running a full business by the time that I was at Stanford. Actually, the choice of going to Stanford was unusual at the time. It was a bit going against the grain. I had a number of mentors um, and, and friends of the family who were saying, you, you should go to New York, you should go to Paris with the artistic trajectory you, you are on, you should go to some of these um, quote unquote artistic centers. And um, some of those were great musicians, Donato. Uh, you know, Wynton Marsalis was a, uh, and has been a great uh, mentor and, uh, and friend. He's like, girl, what are you gonna do in Palo Alto? You need to come to New York, you know? And uh, I, I had the opportunity to, to play and meet for uh, Jean-Pierre Rompal, and he was just kind of horrified at the idea of, of choosing Palo Alto over Paris. Um, and I felt that I made this choice of Silicon Valley because I, I felt then, and, and I feel now that it is really the, the Rome or, or, or Paris uh, uh, or New York or Florence or whatever, what have you, of our time. And you know, technology really does epitomize the the creative uh, spirit of our times. And also, um, the most important thing is going to be the convergence of all these fields, uh, how how they intersect with technology, and how those um, things emanate and ripple out from this place. And so, I wanted to be here to witness that, to help influence it, shape it, be shaped by it. And although it was kind of shocking thing to do at the time, um, looking back, it was definitely the right decision. Uh, Drew, can, can you hear me? I'm using the. Hmm. You can't hear me. No. I, yeah, I'm, for some reason I'm having a little bit of distortion. Um, anyway. Uh, Are you wait? I'm curious. Don't... So, how was, what was, Are what you was able the connection? To... With, what was the connection with? Uh, and how did that come to be? Wait, Donato, are you able to hear me? Yeah, You're can you hear me? I can hear you, fine. Okay, fine. Um, so, Winton is uh, someone that I had uh, gone to hear perform very last minute when I was uh, still in high school, our, our economics teacher had said, I have tickets to this concert and it's a sold out concert if anybody in this class wants, wants tickets to the concert, um, please take them. And so I, I took them uh, and 
I had a lot of familiarity with jazz. And I, my, my father loved jazz music, but I had never seen Winton perform. And that night he just gave an absolutely like uh, pyrotechnical virtuosic performance with jazz at Lincoln Center. And I went down to get a, um, one of the one of his uh, books signed after the concert and i said something to him about his embouchure or something and he said are you are you a musician you must be a musician to ask that question and i said well yeah and he said well what, why are you standing here you know you need to go get your horn so i was like here i'm at a concert i didn't know i was going to be at that afternoon and then he's telling me to go play for him and um so my parents drove me back really fast home, got my flute, came back, started, I started playing in the hallway. He was still had a long, long line of people at that point, still many people signing books. And um, I actually, we have footage of this uh, encounter and it's pretty funny to watch now. This is actually before um, cell phone video and all of that, but my mom had the um, um, frame of mind to 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 grab a video camera and record it, and the whole time, I'm just playing different things, um, and he and some of the other musicians of jazz at Lincoln Center are just kind of swearing and different jazz expletives and saying different things in very colorful language, and then he he began to ask me to do well different orchestral excerpts. He's like, uh, "Can you play Midsummer Night's Dream? Can you play?" Um, this Daphis and Chloe thing. I mean, and I, I actually was quite immersed in those at that time. And so I was playing things that he was asking for. And then he asked for the piano to be brought to the front of the, brought back out because they had broken down the stage. And so we went back from the back of the house to the front of the house. And then he played with me for a while. So we played, there was like now like a circle of people have, were following us. And that was, the, that was the first night that I, that I met him. And that ended up being a decades long, conversation, series of collaborations, um, mutual admiration, uh, different projects that we've worked on, different artwork that I've created for him for his albums, for um, his swinging into the 21st century box set uh, collections that he did. And um, furthermore, just lots of interesting conversations about art, music, jazz, um, Japanese culture, Zen, one of my favorite things that he says a lot or he uh, has said to me is a rest is a rhythm. And I think that it's something that people can take into everyday life. Uh, politicians could, could heed that, uh, talking heads could use that. It's just, we focus so much on what we're saying, what we're making, what we're building, and think less about the spaces in between the things that we're building, the spaces in between the things that we're saying, the spaces in between the notes that are on the page, which is what gives things their elasticity, their lyrical quality, sometimes their meaning. You know, actually blank space is really, really important in negotiation. Like a great negotiator will let a phrase land and not fall into it and wait for the other side and have that kind of uh, restraint. Uh, there's, there's a really interesting article that came out recently about uh, Tim, Tim Cook uh, and some, uh, another Silicon Valley tech leader, I can't recall who, but talking about the importance of the so-called awkward silence, how it's our inclination and want to just fill up space but the power of leaving space, it takes a tremendous amount of discipline and there's a great payoff for how you leave that space and how you shape that space in a variety of different contexts. And that is something that a training in, in music, a background in music and the arts, it's just one of a thousand things that it, it, can, uh, that can, it can give to you. I think I think one of the most uh, fascinating aspects of music making is how close it is to the the world of acting. In other words, uh, you hear actors talk about so much about that. In, to be a great actor, to really be about to really uh, master the art of listening, it's in it's in the moments that you're not. Um, 
producing sound, whether whether it's great work, works of of, of uh, plays uh, uh, or great works of music, it's when when those moments of silence happen in between the notes, as you so eloquently stated, where we learn perspective. And I think that uh, I have to share with you that uh, you asked me in, in one of our earlier email exchanges about uh, uh, certain heroes of mine. And I have to tell you that uh, Winton also was a great inspiration to me uh, when uh, at about the same age as you, he came to where I grew up, which was Reno, Nevada. And he, and his, he gave this mind blowing concert and the way the way Witten uh, weaves um, philosophy, politics to a certain extent, um, uh, ethics. I think ethics is a huge plays a huge role in the music making of Witten Marsalis and in jazz in general. Uh, that um, that being a musician, being an artist, being in tech. There, there's a much larger connected world that musicians like him, artists like yourself, uh, cre uh, show us that way forward. And um, I'm curious that how, uh, you know, in that period of time when you then decided to go to, to Stanford, um, what was it, what were those moments of revelation while you were, while you were there um, what what were your what were your focus? What were, what was your academic focus? Focus? How did it um, uh, sort of inspire your art making? What were the areas of focus when I was at Stanford? Mm -hmm. And the and the and the inspiration that what how how did your what you do now? Because I want to I want to take I want to take this next video about your Ambrosia series, mm -hmm. how did that mm -hmm. come to be? What, what, how did it sort of uh, come, come into being? Well, I, I think the, the inspiration were so many of the, the varied threads and, and, and courses that I was taking and also the things that were happening in the Bay Area at that time. Mm -hmm. And again, that's why I chose to go to a place like Stanford um, to have a broad-based liberal arts education, but to have this multidisciplinary environment where I could take um, multivariable calculus and I could take s some science and I could take psychology, I could take the classics, but I it would be very different from going to like a conservatory type route or an uh, art school type route, which is be very heads down and uh, almost with blinders on with a singular focus in, so, in, a very, in a very narrow way. And um, art is very comprehensive. It encompasses all the different elements of our world. And uh, I think actually that's one of the big problems with art schools today is that they're not preparing our young people for the um, fourth industrial revolution, uh, virtual reality, augmented reality, enveloped um, artificial intelligence world that we're now living in. They don't teach you how to code. They don't teach artists how to code. They don't really um, create bridges for artists to integrate their, their uh, understanding with uh, science, technology, and other fields. So uh, what was my inspiration? My inspiration were all these things that were around me that I, I wanted to have. Um, uh, I wanted to be exposed to many different conversations with um, physicists. I, I got to know um, Douglas Oshroff uh, and Martin Pearl. Both of them were Nobel Prize winning physicists at Stanford. Um, so many uh, great academics. Um, uh, Max Dresden, another physicist from the history of sci science, who was a friend of Einstein. And actually, he played the piano and uh, would play with Einstein at these different uh, salons. And uh, Max Dresden is, was very uh, elderly at that time and he's no longer alive, but he uh, told these extraordinary stories. And so I, I, I will never meet Einstein, but to, be, to, to, to meet uh, such a, a scientific luminary like Max and all, hear his interactions with people like uh, uh, 
like like Einstein and also how much music influenced someone like him um that was very that was very interesting do you, do you feel that you bring up such a you bring up a point that I've thought so often about because I started my education in, in state schools and by and large it was they it was a very good overall good education and I have to tell you the moment I started going to conservatory I felt I felt I went as an, as an older student as a graduate student and I felt sad for frankly I did feel sad for these uh, undergraduates at this very well-known conservatory because I knew they weren't learning anything about history anything about philosophy anything about science that the courses that were offered were um, introductory at best and do you feel that this uh, that this over specialization has uh, has set up I think you know, I think I'm sort of we already know the answer but has poorly set up these people to to these young musicians and young artists to sort of survive in today's world and and how do you think it can change well, I, yeah, I think I think that there are so many different, uh, very deep problems with the educational system at large, and, and and particularly in the arts, and we just have to go back and look at the source and and see how was this done well, and then try to re reverse engineer it because right now it's a tremendous loss for our world. And I, if I, I look back at somebody like Leonardo da Vinci. He was someone who dissected countless cadavers and was truly committed. I mean, he, he would spend nights with decaying bodies so that he could spend the time that he needed to, to access these different um, bodies to do this work. And so this, these anatomical studies, they really informed his, his paintings and his drawings. And he understood every bone and every sinew and... Um, so on and so forth. And so when he captured the human body, he captured it like no one would, had captured it before. However, the flip side of it is that his art also informed uh, his, his anatomical studies, his art and his artistic practices and his um, artistic disciplines. They also informed the scientific part of parts of what he was doing. For example, um, he was very fascinated with the uh, human brain and the human nervous system. And he wanted to map out the kind of inner um, cerebral ventricles and get kind of a three dimensional picture of the brain. And so he was the first person in history to take a moldable substance and pour it into a human skull and get a casting of that shape and then take that shape out so he could do these exploded drawings of the brain. But he came up with that idea because he had been pushing the envelope and pushing the frontiers with new ways of, of casting metal and creating these monumental sculptures at sizes. Um, he was dreaming up sizes of, of sculptures that no one had dreamed up before. But I think that this uh, cross-pollination between the two is really interesting. His, his scientific work advanced his art, but his artistic work advanced his science. And uh, he, that's what we need to do. That's what we need to take the example of. And that's the kind of way we need to approach these things today and try to to have as ambitious of 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 uh, achievements as as he had um one thing that really impressed me that i was just reflecting on the other day donato was that he was very fascinated with fluid dynamics and he was fascinated with the human heart and so he wanted to understand how it works so he created a sculpture of a human heart out of glass filled it with water put seeds in the water so that he could see how the water was liquid was flowing through and at the end of the day long story short he came to some, some conclusions about how the human heart operates that would later take anatomists 450 years to figure out and come up with so he figured this out like 450 years ahead of everyone else and he didn't publish a lot of his work he wasn't that excited about you know the nitty-gritty of like publishing things he was more interested in just discovering them so it took in many instances for so many of his, his discoveries it took hundreds of years for the rest of us for the rest of the world 
uh, for other people to say to come up with those discoveries and then disseminate them and share them with the world. I think we need to go back to people like that, and um, uh, many of those kind of great thinkers and, and model that. Absolutely agree. It reminds me, of course, also of the a fairly recent discovery of of how Vermeer most likely years, used camera obscura to create his sense of propor proportion and detail. Whereas, you know, of course, his works of art are incredible, but it was always uncanny how he was able to create perspective. And now, of course, this this marriage of art and science has really always been there. And this and, you know, f f it's over specialization has um, it's for better and for worse. And I think, uh, I think that for us um, uh, going forward, as you have done so, so well with your, with what you have created and what you talk about uh, uh, is, is really a, a key essential for, for us as artists to be relevant and to, to really also uh, lead into the future Showing, showing the rest of humanity the connectiveness that art always has had, among beyond art, beyond with with the sciences, with with all of the things we've discussed. Tell us a little bit about the Ambrosia series. Yeah, so uh, the Ambrosias are um, well. There's there's three categories of works that we are building right now at, at, at Drew Kataka Studios. Um, right now we're the leading art studio in Silicon Valley and we are shipping artworks to collectors in over 30 countries and in five continents. And um, we are really interested in the experiential kind of living organism nature of the artwork. And this is kind of an idea that I have been exploring for many years. And we're focused right now currently on three different uh, categories of works. The first are the ambrosias, as you, as you mentioned. Um, they're a signature type of work for us. They're, they're colorful, they're complex, they're interacting with the, the light in powerful ways. Um, they, you know, every time you interact with the work, you see a different uh, part of yourself and the environment that you're in mixed together in a, in a new way. And they're also inspired by neural networks. I know that you have a video of it that you're going to show. Um, the second type of works uh, that we create are called celestial lace. And those are fabricated from um, the highest quality of stainless steel, but then brought to a mirror polish finish, which is a very, um, technical treatment that's difficult to execute and there is this vocabulary of highly faceted um, fragments and complex surfaces uh, that we've developed and then the third um, the third type of work that we are building here is technology artwork so uh, we really are very excited about the future of of art with the medium of augmented reality and virtual reality all the different possibilities there. Uh, and then over the years, different art science collaborations like art that I created for the first zero gravity art exhibit in space at the International Space Station um, and many different interesting uh, partnerships and different types of works using technology as a, as a medium and trying to bend it to an artistic purpose. So the, the video that you have of the Ambrosias, you'll you'll see how you'll, you'll see how, how a video um, captures them more than even a photograph because they're so dynamic and they are changing all the time. And they are also the first fully modular artworks that we've created. So the different pieces inside can actually be moved by the collector and um, rotated and positioned differently. So there's a great deal of agency that someone has when they own that piece and it you know where you put one um color or one painting with respect to another changes the mix of color and the look of the piece which also is changing depending on the time of day and it's also changing depending on where you place this and we they can actually be moved very smoothly with the wheels that we have underneath them so when you have them in a space they almost create like a portal like effect into that 
room or facing out to that window. Does the space play any role in the creation of the work prior or is it never really into, into consideration? What do you mean by that? The space where the, the art will go in, what does do you have an idea of the space prior to creating that that's, work? That's a really good question. And so I always, my, my process, well, with my team, what we do is really, it's very consultative with the client or with the collector. It's almost like um, our studio is almost as like working with an architectural firm mm -hmm. uh, is more more descriptive of how we work because when uh, a collector comes to us with um, an idea of something we want, uh, we listen to them and understand where are they coming from? What are they trying to capture? Like uh, it's almost like problem solving, but then hopefully exceeding expectations. And so, yes, I take into account where, first of all, does this collector have in mind that this work may go? What's the history of that place? What's the meaning of that place? What's the significance of that particular moment for them? Um, and uh, if there's a particular occasion, what that means, you know, so for example, to give two concrete examples, we recently did a work for a, uh, a collector where the ambrosia was a gift from him to his wife on the occasion of their anniversary and um, parts of a poem that he had written we actually deconstructed and put that within the piece so there was this personal connection and we have the ability to do that to take all sorts of different um, imagery and text and meaning and you'll see when you see the video how that how that can potentially be augmented and amplified and then in other cases um, we we're doing works in steel, I might actually go and um, make sure that we get the space 3D scanned and mm. go do a 3D capture, take multiple passes of a whole site, take that, take that back to the studio and go live with that space when thinking about how am I going to create this sculpture because I, it has to be in dialogue with the place and I, I want to live with that place. So I, I can go and visit it two or three times, but I can actually t take um, a good geometrical impression of what it is and, 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 and live with it further, if you will, in virtual reality, walking around in it and kind of thinking about things from, from all angles, which is what is essential in sculpture. Let's watch the video. Ambrosias are a series of reflective sculptures that magically transform the viewer and the environment around them. I named them after Ambrosia, which in ancient Greek mythology was the food of the gods and would confer immortality to whoever tasted it. It's so diverse and at the same time it's harmony. So it reflects to a large extent our world, which is let's say today multi-conceptual, multipolar, and you have big pieces, small pieces, but at the end what we strive for is harmony. You no know, art and culture is such a language of the heart. And we need um, when we communicate not only to apply our brains and our rational thinking, but we need some feelings, and the feelings are stimulated by them. Uh, I'm curious a, co a couple of things. The uh, they both are outdoor and indoor 
they, they have both they've served in both purposes they've, 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 they go well how do you feel uh, do they have a different meaning for you when they're outdoor and they they have sort of a general anyone can see them um, for you when you create that piece for an outdoor venue versus something that's perhaps for a private collector well I think you're speaking to this question of of public versus private art. Yes. And I have created works, many works for many private collectors that are, are, are not public. Like they, I don't put them on my website. I can't really, um, show them and ultimately there's many many people who will never see them because they're so private and um, usually this type of client is very private about their their space and so uh, you know i think that those works are are very important and those those collectors are commissioning a lot of important work um, at the same time, I'm very passionate about um, art having no boundaries and really being a, an incredible reservoir of creativity and positive energy for society. And so that's why I have been involved with, over the years, creating so many different artworks uh, with a uh, social um, dimension in them. So whether that's work that I did for Touch Our Future, which was a, an artwork, a digital, digital tapestry interactive artwork around um, decreasing infant mortality or uh, work for the 2016 presidential election around celebrating US women's firsts or different social justice uh, artworks or different um, pieces around like, you know, the portrait of, of Martin Luther King that I did for Stanford. Um, or many, many, many different projects that I've done over the years, uh, because you know I've I've felt that I want to make what I'm doing as as accessible as possible when I have the ability to to do so. Um, and and recently, the the mo one of the most recent um, intersections of art, technology, and social impact that I was involved with was a project called Online Protest. Uh, which was um, an idea that I had after the brutal and horrific killing of George Floyd um, in, this summer. So I had seen that there was a lost opportunity to to for for people who really wanted to contribute their energy to protesting to speaking up against police brutality and could not go out in the streets because of COVID because of, of maybe having prior health condition or maybe taking care of an elderly parent or maybe they just weren't close to one of the major urban centers where these protests were taking place. Um, how to tap into that that energy for good and so I, I created an artwork which was called I Can't Breathe it was the American flag and rippling through that flag were the words I can't breathe. Um, um, uh, honoring the people who've been um, killed in these past years and then we i had i what we we did this this uh seven day online protest uh, i had written to bernice king who's the youngest daughter of martin luther king and i i told her i texted her and i said what do you think about this idea about of doing an online protest and she said i love it it's the best idea i've yet heard and uh so she and i collaborated along with the king center and we did a seven day um, protest, which, which was very grass tops, grass tops and grassroots, and brought together many different faith leaders, people in the NFL, um, people in Hollywood like Ben Stiller, Alyssa Milano, Steve Harvey. But I, I, I also brought Wynton Marsalis, uh, Chelsea Clinton, um, Ellen DeGeneres joined us. It went on to the Tonight Show, so it actually became its own kind of mini movement. Hashtag on, online protests. But then every night. Um, uh, Bernice King gave people actionable things they could do, like sign a petition to ban the chokehold, which went from zero signatures to 40,000 signatures. So we made actual, real, tangible, concrete progress every night. We lead perfectly into the next video, but uh, the subject, of course, is that how art, all art, can be 
uh, used for social change and to be really, uh, again, lead our culture into thinking in, in a more expanded way, uh, showing us how to listen to one another, showing us how to, to feel with one another. And um, tell us a little bit about the video we're about to watch, about your, your connection with the Martin Luther King Center of San Francisco. Yeah, and I and I will say that I think that you know art is a really powerful social force, and we cannot underestimate it. And we really need to make sure we we um, tap into it. Uh, you know, I look at Picasso's Dove of Peace, and I look at the work that he did uh, of something like Guernica, and um, just see what that did for the global peace movement, perhaps more than XYZ meetings of XYZ diplomats in, in, in such and such room. He really made such an impact. Um, you know, that painting, uh, Guernica, is really interesting because it, it, it commemorates the bombing of this small Basque village by German forces. And it was a brutal, brutal, um, uh, Act, act of war, and he created this this painting, um, but just to show you how powerful uh, that work is, it was I think in 2003 that Colin Powell was making his statement to the UN about making the case for the war uh, in Iraq, and the the UN and 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 the U S government and the media decided to cover up this tapestry reproduction of Guernica that was hanging behind him when he gave his speech. Um, they actually, in effect, censored Picasso's work and, and, and covered it up and put a blue banner. And I just, I love this story because it just, if there's any doubt of what, how powerful that work um, was, and also so many years later, the impact that it's still having to really make people wrestle with their consciousness, that's, that, that, re that story really proves it. Um, there's I a. The, I just have to you know, just say one one quick thing about Guernica that I've been I've seen it I've been in Madrid a few times to conduct, and every time I go I make my pilgrimage uh, to Guernica, and there is I can't think of something as powerful that is as abstract as that painting. Everything about that painting is abstract, yet it evokes this overwhelming emotion. It's palpable in the room, whether it's children uh, on, a, on a, a little field trip, Spanish ch children from a field trip, or, or people visiting from all around the world, the same sense of just, uh, just simply being overwhelmed by the, the emotion that's come. Yet, everything in that painting is truly abstract. It's a, it's, I can't think of something other than perhaps, uh, you know, um, a symphony that is purely abstract, creating emotion that is similar. Well, I, I, I agree. And it's really nice to hear you retell in a very vivid way your direct and visceral personal experience with that piece. I, I was looking back at this description of, of a survivor of the, uh, uh, um, of the bombing and i'll just share with you this 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 account and these were the accounts that picasso was reading about in the newspaper that inspired him to create the, the work um, the survivor said the air was alive with the cries of the wounded i saw a man crawling down the street dragging his broken legs pieces pieces of people and animals were lying everywhere in the wreckage there was a young woman i couldn't take my eyes off of her bones were jutting out and sticking up through her dress her head was twisted around to the right. She lay with her mouth open, her tongue hanging out. I, I threw up and I lost consciousness. So this is someone who was a witness and survived being killed. And that those are the types of descriptions that Picasso was uh, thinking about. And we still have these types, this level of violence continue, continuing and continuing on our world uh, today. So, you know, as, as um, artists we are we are citizens and so as citizens we have a responsibility to use our voice 
just like every other citizen, but we can also take the different tools in our um, artistic arsenal and, and use them for good and and we should do that. And back to your point about public art, um, I think public art is a tremendous opportunity to do that. I think oftentimes it does get a bad rap, um, but it doesn't have to be that way. And I think the next generation of public art will be uh, online art and digital art that's done in a really compelling and complex way. And we're going to start to see more and more of that. Um, type of art that leverages new technology and does not require that you as the viewer or the ex person experience the art has to be in one of the major colonial centers of the world to experience it. That you have to be in Rome or Paris or London or New York, that the art is concentrated in those few places, which are also the places that have pillaged the most art from other places around the world. That is a, a way of the past and I think one of the benefits of the new technology, integrating new technologies with cultural practices going forward will be um, democratizing um, this art and culture. Great, let's watch this, 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 this video. Precious Lord was Dr. King's favorite hymn it is a deeply moving piece of music. In fact, Precious Lord is one of the last things King mentioned before he was assassinated. There's a deep kind of soulfulness that you feel when you're here. There's the traces of all these people going all the way back to the 19th century that have walked across these marble floors. And you can feel that energy in the room. What I feel is critical is to make sure that the ideas, uh, the wisdom of Dr. King, that that gets imparted into the fundamental structures of these technologies at the ground floor, that we interweave his ideas and that we permeate his ideas into artificial intelligence algorithms, into virtual reality, whole worlds that are getting built and whole worlds that are going to shape society, shape bias, shape our young people, shape how we see ourselves and how we see the future. We need to go back to some of these incredible ideas that he distilled so skillfully and make sure that we carry them over on this bridge to the future and that Dr. King's legacy is really carried into the future. We, uh, we originally met uh, as uh, guests. We were, I can't remember exactly what our luminaries, I think we were. <laughs> <laughs> they gave us big fancy titles. They gave us a big fancy title. Uh, but uh, the, of course, and I think you feel the same way that the, the really the, the, the fancy titles should, uh, should have been given to those amazing students uh, of Minerva University, which is an online uh, university that was created by our friend Ben Nelson, and uh, the I, I, at first I was uh, wasn't quite sure why I was invited, but then it became per, uh, really uh, you helped in 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 um, uh, answering my question as to why I was invited with with what you were uh, sharing with these incredibly. Um, uh, gifted and curious students who will go out into the world and certainly oh, change that. it. And uh, one one of the things that struck me was that uh, while uh, sort of the, well, the whole concept of Minerva is phenomenal and has always I've always felt it to, to be the case. Uh, but of course, now more than ever, it, it really is appropriate and. Um, inspiring what Ben has created in that it's it's really uh, a, 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 it is online in that it, it they meet virtual virtually but they're all they're in the world um, uh, making change but I feel that uh, what you had to say them say to them was particularly poignant it has a lot to do with what we've, we've already talked about in that art uh, and 
the the way people express themselves, whether it's um, you know uh, creating economy, new economies in in third world countries, or or creating uh, uh, business relationships be between disparate uh, uh, sources, that this idea that art can really be a central point, and I think that for them. I think it was more foreign at first that we were there than I felt at first being there myself. So i just curious about your feelings about Minerva, about how we met and about how the idea of, it, of what is happening with, uh, with something like Minerva is, is helping to change, sort of going back to what we were talking about at the beginning of the conversation. Yeah, so you're talking about Minerva, this university that uh, has a very avant-garde uh, format where the students learn primarily online, but then also it's a hybrid offline, but they travel all around the world from Latin America to Europe and Asia. So they really end up traveling the whole world versus being um, centered in one campus as you would traditionally have. And then they have these magnificent graduation ceremonies where it's not just a traditional ceremony where people give speeches and uh, people kind of get bored. They're actually very lively intellectual debates and round tables where they bring people in to push and pull different ideas and meet the students and the, and the students push us and we push the students and th I think that's what you're talking about the yeah. context in which um, we were you and I were um, some of the people that were brought for this graduation ceremony <laughs> unlike no other which was it's a great idea and I think uh, more more universities should take a page out of that and to your point they're also much more positioned for this post-pandemic world because so much of their curriculum is online and they have built all these ways of, of, of connecting students p in a purely digital format not having to be tethered to the real world uh i thought it was i thought it was great uh, the, the 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 people that they, they had curated to to bring in all such from varied backgrounds um anchored in in real world experiences uh whether it was people in, in nonprofit or business leaders or um, entrepreneurs or people in the art, people in art and culture like you and myself. I, I think that that, that was um, a great idea. And I, I, I received so many notes and uh, uh, little Instagram texts or LinkedIn messages from the students afterwards that had said that they really enjoyed some of those conversations that we were at or they had a question or had made them think. Um, so I think it was a, uh, it's a great format. Um, I think one of the things that I was it, it, talking about, and now it's, it's been a while since we had that conversation, but one of the things that came up was that I was pointing out to them that we have lost the ability to slowly consume um, information. We, we, we just, we've been so behaviorally modified by the way that we interact with technology and it's fragmented our, our thinking and everything has been unbundled into smaller and smaller pieces. So uh, it's really one of, one, of, one of many really powerful and positive things about deeply engaging with art and music is to go back to slowly consuming and and also benefiting from the effects that that would have on one's brain. So what, what I mean by that is, for example, um, listening to cl classical music is is actually a great way to practice mindfulness. I mean, to they actually have to be able to stay focused and stay immersed in a whole symphony. Like how many people today, Donato, really will just sit down and listen to one full symphony, let alone one Wagner opera. <laughs> we, we really only have the attention span right now to listen to a three minute pop song and a two minute pop song and a five minute pop song. And that really kind of atrophies our brain because we, we've lost the ability to do this kind of active listening where you're 
thinking about this motif that came in this mo movement and then an hour and a half later, your brain is connecting it to something that you heard before and there's multiple layers. There's all these different harmonies and polyphonies and just different themes and things that are being interwoven. And it's so cognitively stimulating for your brain, but just also just training yourself to stay immersed in something like that for a period of hours is something that um, most people don't do and have completely lost touch with how to be able to do it at all. Same thing for the visual arts. Um, when you, when people go to a museum, um, they look at things in actually a very frenetic way. Um, and there was a st scientific study that was done where uh, they let people go through kind of um, the museum at their own pace, like taking lots of pictures of everything that they saw, which is something that people do when they go to museums. Oh, I, I want to put that on Instagram. I want to take a picture of that, take a picture of that. Then they had a, a control group that were not allowed to take any pictures, but were only allowed to just look at the works. And then when they compared those two groups side by side, the people who took all the photographs remembered far less than the people who actually just looked at the work directly, unmediate, right. unmediated through the technology. Right. And so, um, when you look at some of these great uh, masterpieces, sculptures, paintings, they were originally supposed to be th pieces that you would sit down and experience over a period of hours, over a period of weeks, not in a split second. And so if we're only experiencing them in such a short way, then we're not actually um, getting the full benefit and breadth and depth of, of those works. We, we uh, were talking about our heroes and and what we were what you have already mentioned one of yours uh well a few of yours already but uh in terms of your instrument your main instrument jean-pierre ron paul mm -hmm. was someone who remains an inspiration to you to this day and and as he does to me i mean he was one of the first artists that uh i was aware of as a young person, you know, he wow. had so many recordings that were, you know, the Claude Bowling, uh, oh my gosh. And, which are phenomenal. And, and you know, he was uh, really until Emmanuel Paou, the principal flutist of the Berlin Phil, there really hadn't been someone who played the flute. Of course, James Galway was the other person in that, in, in that world. But um, tell us your connection with Jean-Pierre Rompal and, and what we're going to share. Well, I first saw Jean-Pierre Rompal on Sesame Street <laughs> and it had made a huge impression on me. And I really hope that we continue to bring that caliber of artist and musician to morning children's television, because today one of the things that saddens me is so much of children's television is just about marketing and getting kids addicted to big brands uh, and to buying stuff and getting in the habit of wanting to take their kids, take their parents to go buy them stuff. But bringing artists like that to something like T Sesame Street really has a huge impact on, on young people. It did on me. And actually you can, on YouTube, you can actually, st you can look up some of his uh, Sesame Street performances there. Some of them are on there and it's, they're, they're pretty amazing. But I, that's where I first saw him. Then I got a chance to see him in concert um, uh, when I was very young and we were like way up in the balcony, had my binoculars looking looking down and I s saw him playing, I was captivated and looked at my mom and said, you know, one, one day I would love to meet Mr. Ron Paul. And I would also, I would love to have a gold flute like he does as well. And um, I uh, studied the flute for many years. I, I had um, great teachers, um, including, Keith Underwood, who I, I studied with um, many, many years. Uh, I don't know if you've ever um, intersected with him, but he has um, taught a lot of, of, of principal flutists all over the world and also just other, uh, other musicians in other disciplines because his techniques are so interesting. They actually apply mm -hmm. to other instruments. Okay. Um, and I, uh, you know, was just, I loved, I loved Ron Paul's recordings. I, I, ended up owning all of his recordings. Um, he, I, I think he was the greatest, he's the greatest flutist that has ever lived. Uh, he pushed 
the instrument. He innovated with the instrument. He took violin concertos that had never been performed on the flute and he took them to a whole nother, nother level on the flute in a way which people didn't think could be done. Uh, and one thing that's interesting about him is if you notice like when he's playing, he's always so calm. He has almost like a sleepy look on his face. He does, and I have noticed that. He has a sleepy look and if, and, and uh, uh, if you look at a lot of other woodwind players, and I think this is just like, it, it just, for me, it shows like how far, you know, the gap is or like what separates kind of uh, a, a, a flute god or woodwind god like this from, from, from mortal but, but brilliant players is that like a lot of people look very tense. It's like a lot of eyebrows moving around and a lot of just like tension in the face. And he is just so dead centered and calm and almost, he almost looks like sublime, like he's in a state of bliss because that's, that's where, that's where he is. And he's actually uh, channeling that when he plays. I um, had written to him when I was um, in, in, in high school. I wanted to meet him and was close to meeting him um, a couple of times, but he would come to the US and he would, his tours would get canceled. Long story short, I eventually did get to go meet and play for him. And it was actually um, with the help of, of uh, Winton who helped make that introduction uh, for me. And I went up to go see Ron Paul in San Francisco. Um, my mom and I went to meet him at the St. Francis Hotel. He was at the top of the hotel and I opened the door and he had like all these flowers, like an opera diva in his room. And it was like so French and everything. And I, I brought, I had my, my gold flute at that time and I opened it and he had a case that had three gold flutes in it. And I, I played some of the Cacciatorian Concerto, which um, that's one of my favorite recordings of, of his. I love his recording of that. It's, it's superhuman and it's, um, it's extraordinary. Um, he also played my flute and I say that he, he gave it a molecular massage because uh, <laughs> I could feel the, the vibration coming off of it when he gave it back to me. And I think I just would love for people to go listen to his recordings, find videos of him on YouTube we'll because a lot that. of people don't we'll know who he is. Comments. We'll post some in the comments. Yeah, you're right. It's, it is a, it's a travesty that he's sort of, um, fallen, his name has fallen off the off the band, current bandwagon of what, whatever the classical music world is today. I think what we should do, because I actually have to run and do a rehearsal of all things, we can't see that, mm -hmm. uh, we'll end with Ron Paul's video. And I promised that I was going to share one of my current heroes as well, who just happens to be John Prine. I'm totally obsessed with John Prine right now. Um, but Drew, I wanna thank you so much for taking part in this and sharing what you uh, you you have been so inspiring to me, really, these last few months. I'm so thankful that we happen to be on <laughs> Minerva at the same time. And Ser serendipitously brought together. Indeed, indeed. And I look forward to the time when we can actually meet in person. <laughs> yes, I would like to go to one of your concerts. And um, I, I want to tell everyone if they want to connect with anything that I'm doing, my handle, which is on the screen, at Drew Kataoka, is on Instagram. It's on Twitter. And um, Drew Katalka Art is on Facebook. And Drew Katalka Studios is the handle for the studios on Instagram. And my website is dru.net. And I have a newsletter there that people subscribe to. It talks about creativity. So I'm happy to connect with anyone on those platforms. And then I think the video that you're showing is going to be a performance of um, Precious Lord, which was Dr. Martin Luther King's favorite um, hymn. That was the one that he loved the most. And he actually had mentioned it um, the, uh, the night that, uh, the, the day that he was assassinated, he was talking about that. And um, sadly and tragically, he was killed. But he, he, he would um, talk about this piece often. And uh, I played it on the occasion of the 90th birthday celebration of his at Stanford. Thank you so much, Drew. Thank you for everything that you do, Donato. Thank you for your cultural leadership and for who you are in this world and all of the great uh, cultural initiatives that you're, that you're working on.
<laughs> so appreciate it. Take care. dedicate that piece that I played to Clay and Susan Carson for their tireless multi-decade service to